Well, well, well. <laughs> Here we are, humans, coming to see all about artificial intelligence. Someone said to me, you want to know about artificial intelligence, ask your mother-in-law. <laughs> but of course, in the Me Too uh, society we're living in today, mother-in-laws are great. We love mother-in-laws. But seriously, ladies and gentlemen, we have a fantastic session for you, very pertinent, pertinent for the business community, the investment community, and those of you that want to know what's coming next. So what we're going to do today is we'll start off, we found an interesting video clip to give those of you that want to learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence before we dig deep with some of the world's top specialists and also people who really are working on this very closely in the investment community. So let's roll the video, let's check this out, and use this to give yourselves just a sense of how artificial intelligence is really going to be much bigger than you expect. Roll the video. <laughs> when everything becomes linked with everything else, matter becomes mind and the possibilities become endless. Imagine 50 billion IoT connected devices by 2020. Now, imagine the economic impact of these connected machines. Four to eleven trillion dollars per year by 2025. Wearable devices, environmental sensors, agricultural machinery, components in a vehicle, or devices in homes can all be connected to deliver insights and drive transformation. So imagine if you had smart devices in your home, your car, your workplace, or even in yourself. The world becomes alive. That's Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is making everyday objects into data factories. When Internet of Things, along with big data, meets artificial intelligence, this interface will become enlivened with intelligence, and a new world will take birth, which will increasingly talk back to us. Imagine the kind of world that it would be. Imagine the revolution that will usher in the way we see the world. The external world will become the extension of our mind, like an extension of our thoughts. Imagine a world that is responsive, a world that is optimized for human creativity, a world that is intelligent. The Internet of Things is a breeding ground for new AI-driven solutions and experiences, from self-driving cars to intelligent homes to health. Welcome to the world of endless possibilities. So that gives you some kind of idea. You can see it's very widespread and really affecting literally every aspect of life. So I'd like to introduce you to uh, the members of our, uh, our panel today. And first of all, very great pleasure to welcome uh, an, an original native of Geneva, but for the last nine years living here in Singapore, Nadia Thalman. Give Nadia a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nadia is the director of the Institute of uh, Media Innovation here at Nanyang Technical, uh, Technology University was a founder um, director of Mirror Lab, which is a lab in uh, Geneva of interdisciplinary, um, the human computer animation, looking at the formulation. And um, uh, Nadia had actually created what is a very, very well known, the first female robot with human emotion, human sensibilities, and human senses. Nadine, it's really a great pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, I know that you've got a lot to tell us about the way that robots, or certainly humanoid robots, are really benefiting from the wealth of what's going on with artificial intelligence. So we've got some good questions to ask you. Uh, next, uh, we'd like to welcome, uh, all the way from Toronto in Canada, uh, Humera Malik. Please give Humera a, a, a big round of applause. Humera is the founder and CEO of Canvas Analytics, 
a company that was started in Toronto in 2016, is already making uh, a lot of uh, noise and a lot of uh, really important moves in the area of analytical artificial intelligence. And just a couple of weeks ago, her company, Canvas, was awarded a very, very important prize in Canada. Uh, it's the ICX Prize for Innovations. Congratulations. You're one of 20 companies that were chosen from all across Canada for your excellence in the whole area of analytical artificial intelligence. So bravo, well done, excellent, very, very well done. Uh, then we'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Miss Virginie Maisonneuve. Uh, please give Virginie a big uh, round of applause. And uh, Virginie is based here in Singapore. She's the Chief Investment Officer of East Spring Investments, uh, very involved in the management of investments, investment performance. She's a fluent Mandarin speaker, and she is uh, uh, formerly had been uh, the ex uh, head of global equities at Schroders, also at PIMCO, but someone that is really watching the performance of investments in this whole area so that we would really be able to talk. I'd like you to introduce yourself to the audience. <laughs> That was so special. Of course. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Aisha Khanna. I am based in Singapore. I am the CEO and co-founder of Addo AI, which is an artificial intelligence advisory based in Singapore. And uh, we focus on AI engines and big data lakes for companies such as SMRT, Singtel, uh, Japanese insurance firm Sampo, and uh, large banks such as Habib Bank in Pakistan. So there we are. That's, this gives us a really interesting blend. And how many of you have noticed that there are four women on this particular session? So <laughs> maybe this, the women are going to be dominating this sector. So come on, you guys. We've got to give them support because, after all, women hold up half the sky. And in this case, they're holding up almost the whole sky on this particular <laughs> stage. Virginie, we'd like to start with you because you come from this uh, very deep... Uh, base uh, in investments and uh, looking after portfolios of investments. Can you give us a sense of some of the things that you are looking at in terms of AI in the financial and investment uh, world? Okay, and real impact, which was what the real you impact. wanted. The real impact. Precisely so, right. First, um, I'm really happy to be on a female panel. As a former head of the uh, diversity network for the uh, CFA in the UK, I think this is, uh, this is great. So thank you for, for this. Good for Milken. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so if, if I think about the real impact of AI from an investment perspective, clearly um, I've always thought about key trends to really frame investment decisions. And for many years now, some of my key trends have been demographics, climate change, and technology, and how they melt or how they combine together to create competitive forces in, in, in equity and, and generally uh, markets. And what's been really interesting is in the last few years, really in AI, you've seen big tech investments. So you've seen Google, Apple, Baidu, Tencent. That was where a lot of the big money was spent. And I think that we are now, in terms of the ecosystem, at a stage where we're going to go and accelerate into the next stage, which is really broad, broadly application of AI. And the reason for that is the ecosystem is ready. So we've got 2 billion internet uh, users going to 5 billion. As you mentioned in your video, uh, 15 to 20 billion uh, connected devices, 1 trillion gigabyte of data by 2025, uh, which is you know, 10 times higher than what we have in, uh, had in 2016. So all of that is, is there to really promote that ecosystem and that, uh, that growth. And broadly speaking, uh, the topic that we had was positive and dark sides, right, of AI. On the positive side, I see this as a huge productivity enabler. So in terms of growth, in terms of economic growth, in terms of education, for example, huge enabler, combined with cost reduction. So AI is very deflationary. 
And I don't mean only uh, laying off workers to put machines, which of course will lower cost a lot, like we're seeing in telcos, for example, but also in terms of cost of capital, maintaining things better, being much more nimble in the way we use resources. So you can move from UPS to you know, many companies who are not including Google, putting AI into their energy, for example, uh, chain, and how much savings they've made. Um, and of course, all of that profit and productivity and lower cost is very good for market. So that's the key point. On the dark side, uh, the impact on humans and jobs is actually quite tricky. Uh, and to me, that combined with something I talked at the last Milken conference in, in LA on, on AI and geopolitics, creates an environment of uh, fear, probably, feeling of lack of safety, and a lot of uncertainty, and that's more a qualitative factor that governments will have to absolutely deal with it. So if I can just go very high level on, on economy, for example, and a few key sectors and conclude on, on the dark side, uh, economically, if you look at 2030 as a target, uh, McKinsey establishes that you know, $13 trillion of GDP added to the global economy, which is equivalent to 1.2% growth or 16% of current GDP, which is actually really massive. But the impact on countries are going to be very different. So interestingly, the developed economies are going to benefit more. Impact 20, 25% of economic value versus developing economy, except China, of course, five to 15%. And this is because you need a certain level of an ecosystem in order to enable uh, that, that productivity growth. In terms of sectors, again, Accenture, McKinsey did a lot of work. Uh, impact between 1% to 9% of revenue, and in terms of value creation, up to 128% value creation if you look at the travel industry, so massive. Of course, if you look at healthcare, for example, huge savings, as much as 300 billion uh, in, in, uh, in the US, of course, for China, we had already 6.5% of uh, healthcare cost as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and we've seen Pingang Doctor with hundreds of millions of, uh, of uh, customers already. So a lot there. And not only in diagnostic, not only in surgery, but also in time management. So 43% of doctors' time is spent on admin matters, which, of course, you can, you know, with, with AI, really automate. Uh, if you look at retail, retail is mostly, you know, about choosing the right products, prediction, inventory management, and then uh, warehouse management. And, of course, AI will impact that amazingly between 20 and 50% over the next 10 to 15 years. And for telco, if you think that most of, or at least 50% of telco cost is employment or people, 40% uh, of telco cost within uh, the labor is used for uh, calling and call center. And that is going to be completely automated. So lowering for European companies, for example, as much as 60 billion. Uh, and Orange, for example, in France has just uh, put in some new systems. Uh, decline of calls from clients, problem calls by 20%, KPN, 30% uh, improvement in terms of the um, uh, late payment that clients had. So a lot of really good things. The one thing I want to finish my remarks on is, again, that dark side. And there, I think it's about education. So the skills we're going to need are going to be very different. A lot of people have talked about that. But I think if we want to be complementary to the machines, it's about you know, not only using the machine, knowing how to find the data, how to use the data, but also being much more creative. And of course, our, generally, our education systems are not uh, there. Interestingly, I went back to the US. If you look at US growth for the past 40 years, 3.5%, 2.4% of that came from productivity improvement. 30% of that came from education improvement. And there I'm watching what China is doing, which is fascinating. The Ministry of uh, Education has just announced that by 2020, every university in China will need to have data mining as a course and basically algo writing. And I see you know, algo writing as the new English. If you don't know no how to write that. algos, it's going to be a, a, no a big issue. And, uh, you know, 
When you see how they've structured, we're going to have over 100 new majors pairing a lot of degrees, so from psychology to geography to whatever, with AI in one way or another. I think this is a really good model for us to equip generations to come to actually deal with this employment issue that, that we're going to have. So just that's it. Thank you very much. Very insightful. So President Macron in France has been a great protagonist for this. In fact, there's a famous school now in Paris called Carandeur 42. How many of you know the significance of the word 42? How many of you read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? That's right. <laughs> the secret of the universe is number 42. And there's schools now, both in Silicon Valley and in Paris, that teach coding and algorithms. Very important in understanding this. A lot of people feel that employment and people in employment are going to suffer. But of course, all the new jobs that are going to be made in this 21st century, the technological era, very, very important. Um, Humira Malik, I'd like to ask you about Canvas, particularly because what you've been looking at is how industrial companies think about uh, business transformation, and you're looking at transport, manufacturing, retail, energy, industrial AI, how to maximize output, how to optimize process reliability to reduce defects. Give us a sense of some of these things that you do and give us some examples of real life stuff that you're doing the way you use your analytics embodying AI. Sure, um, and I'll continue on what you started was, I, I think it's a question of demand and supply. So what Canvas Analytics or what my company really looks at is it's a matter of how the world of industrial side is preparing itself for the future. Um, we are, we are tackling an industry that I call a sleeping giant. Um, that industry hasn't evolved. Every time it has to evolve, it has to go through a revolution. An industrial revolution that we're going through right now, which is called the fourth industrial revolution, the industry can't change without going through a revolution. So the journey we embark on is here's an industry that's, that's trying to meet the demands of the future. The future is how much food do we need to produce? How much energy do we need to produce? How many cars do we need to produce? So now if you look at that industry and you look at how and where it is, in current state, it's not going to meet the growing needs of the food demands that we have and the energy demands that we have. Is that because of the increase in population, 7 billion to 9 billion Correct. over the next 20 years? That's right. The number of people that are going to be on this planet Earth, the current structure that we have of the industrial side is not going to be able to meet those demands. So humans are not meant for doing repetitive functions that we do today in these industrial environments. Right. So humans are constantly, you talked about some of these functions that, that do uh, mm -hmm. up to 30%. In certain industrial operations, they do 100% of those repetitive functions. Mm -hmm. So naked eye inspections every day, I'm looking at, at parts that I'm producing and I'm doing naked eye inspections of those parts. Mm -hmm. That's not what humans are meant for. We've got better tools to do it. Yeah. How do we use those tools is really where AI plays a role. AI comes in to learn. So this is machine learning and AI, where it comes in to play a role and learn these functions and actually tries and automate these functions. From there on, what you go in, you put humans, the dark side of it, you actually put them at higher level functions. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the learning of algorithms mm -hmm. and things come. Uh, we went out to, to actually disrupt um, this market because we believe that everybody, it's a very focused approach we took. We took an approach on the industrial market because, first of all, uh, it, has, it has large amounts of data. Uh, they're data-rich, information-poor industry. Uh, it's, it seems to be the right target the for the manufacturing AI. industry. The manufacturing is. industry. It's, right. it's a lot of data, but there is no information that's being generated from that data. Why um, is that? Because they just haven't had the ability to. It's a very siloed way of operating that they have had. Right. So a company that has got 300 operations around the world, everything is very siloed. And they just haven't embarked on it. They haven't just, just gone on it. But surely if you're looking at scaling up, like has happened with Chinese manufacture, wouldn't data be just a fundamental element of it? I was with one of the largest Chinese manufacturers this morning, and you would think that would be the case, oh. but it's not. Hmm. And because we, we haven't built this industry to be data driven, that's why. Uh -huh. And so they have embarked on this journey of industrial revolution where they're going down this path of creating digital environments so they can start to actually collect this data. 
we come in because what we're trying to do at Canvas is we're basically creating data scientists within these environments. We're making an industrial operator into a data scientist by packaging all of the AI into our product and now allowing them to start using it day one, start using it. Don't wait for somebody to come in and they're gonna bring in a team of data scientists. Start using it today. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy journey. It's, a, it's really where you actually take a, a kid and you start teaching them how to use mm -hmm. AI. So what we have done is we have taken this journey and we have actually gone and embarked on this journey to go out and transform everybody and make them into data scientists. And that's because we think this is an industry that was waiting for something like this to happen. We have actually brought in Google as an investor. Okay. They have come in and they have joined hands with us because we, we all believe that this is the future. Well, as Virginie mentioned about Google, of course, they spent $400 million buying DeepMind, Correct. which is uh, a very successful company. But let me ask you this. If you look at your analysis and your analyzing, would I be correct in saying that the idea is to predict, adapt, and then does that lead to scale? Give us some sense of that. Um, the idea is to optimize automate and create autonomous operations. Autonomous operations. Correct. And, and then how do you make that transition so that you literally change not only your machine line, but your human in, uh, component? Um, so today it's more of a very looking at it when things have happened, looking at a quality of what you have produced after it has happened and all that has now become scrap. What we're allowing them to do is use that data to know what you're going to produce. What would be the quality of the sugar, the starch? What would be the quality of the pasta that I'm going to produce? And how can I increase the shelf life of that pasta by knowing everything that is happening throughout the production process? That's what we do. We actually go in and put AI around the industrial operation, around that process for them to know in the future. 20 minutes in advance, an hour in advance, 45 days in advance, what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. From there on, these AI agents actually learn from that environment. Well, and from there on, these AI agents then completely automate. Now they are drawing inferences. They're the ones who are making decisions and implementing decisions at the end. So would this also give you some idea about predictive maintenance, for example, of your of your line, of your machinery? So when you look at a process, it's got, it's got the two layers to it. It's got the, the assets, the actual equipment that's running the process, and then uh, the process metrics itself. So we actually look at the holistic 360 view of the process, and we say how the assets are performing so that you would know how your process is performing and you would know what your yield would look like, not just in terms of the volume of the yield, but actual quality of the yield that you're producing as well. Energy is one continuous process, and it's one of the highest cost that these plants use. We go in and we actually tell them how much energy they're consuming and how much they should be consuming, which is predicting how much they should be consuming. So at certain points, they're actually able to reduce the amount of energy that they use throughout their production processes. So one of the things about AI and the huge amounts of data that you have to crunch to get it is the huge amount of energy that is being used. One of the leading companies in the world is actually based in Siberia because of the cold weather it's less than half a cent per kilowatt hour of providing the energy. Someone has said that you might need more nuclear power plants to just basically process the energy that's going to be required for this AI revolution. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Um, to a certain extent, yes, but that's really where AI comes in to change that. If we don't change it now, that is what's going to happen. Uh -huh. And that's really where a lot of these things are turning into creating efficient energy, so that it's about efficient energy utilization. It's not about, I need to always run all of my energy assets at the maximum capacity. I need to run them as per the demand of what my utilization would be. Right. And that's really the key role AI plays. And so in terms of the way that you operate, you're Canadian, Toronto, now a key, key center for global AI creativity and innovation. But you're looking at global clients and a global remit for basically doing this analytical surgery. Correct. <laughs> analytical surgery, yes, that's a good way to put it. We actually work with clients in North America, in Europe, and now in Asia as well. So mm -hmm. we're actually launching customers now here in Singapore. We're working with people in China. There is a need for AI everywhere but there's a place to get started with it. And I think everybody has embarked on this journey. We're finding different people at different stages of, of going on the AI journey. When somebody says, I have an AI project, it's an interesting question to me because you really don't know what you're looking for. You, you basically need to embark on a journey which is going to make, make future for you, and AI is just part of it. So we're finding people all over the place, actually. Uh, we've found Singapore market to be very, very progressive. Why is um, that? 
I think because here, the realization that humans are not going to be enough to continue and the dark side that you talk about, I'm a Star Wars fan, so I look at force. Force <laughs> has got two aspects to it. There's a force positive and a force negative part. And the negative part, the dark part of this force is you have to be ready to embrace that it's going to, at certain point, replace certain jobs. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's taking away those jobs. It means that it's going to create a new set of jobs that uh, we don't yeah. even know that exist. Absolutely yet. correct. OK, so may the force be with you. It already <laughs> is. That's a good thing. Um, um, Madame Thalman, uh, I'd like to just ask you, you were working on a fascinating area because you're looking at the whole notion of social robots, mixed realities, medical simulation. You've developed this robot, Nadine, that recognizes people, speaks, gesture memory, it expresses mood and emotions, remembers actions. Tell us about it, and I think you've got a few uh, visuals for us to also see. Um, <clears throat> can we uh, pull up uh, Nadine? Slide number six, yeah. <laughs> Number six? Yeah, anyway, I can speak uh, without the slides, but now you see, because if we speak of Nadine, I think it's very important, uh, those who maybe didn't see it in Singapore, she was six months in the Art Science Museum. So she's five That is Nadine in the middle there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a middle Nadine. It's also Nadine's first image. But what I like to say is, for myself, I think that in the future, we need absolutely to have interface, which I would name Nadine. A human, let's say, computer interface that help us in anything. Because if you look today, even if you go shopping in Singapore, it's new. You have, uh, you know, you have to take care of your own food and, you know, with a machine, do your, the job yourself. And it goes on with ATM and so many other things where before we had a service. Actually, the service is done by ourselves. So we become so overloaded, also having 1,000 mails per day and so on. I mean, at least it's my case because I chair not only uh, this institute in Singapore, but I have 10,000 kilometers away another lab, which is Mira Lab in University of Geneva. So just to say our modern life needs companions, intelligent companions that are able to support us in everything. So that's the reason why since 30 years I started my career dreaming of it with virtual human. And in Miralab I made a head only realistic robot. And now you see Nadine. So what Nadine is done for, so she's growing up because it's not obvious to imitate a human. I put the first image just to tell you it's nothing in fact to do with humans. It's just imitation. So when we speak of emotion, don't believe that Nadine can, I don't know, feel anything. Is a machine, <laughs> nothing. Like your laptop, a laptop doesn't feel. Nadine doesn't feel. So this is exactly the same, but she mimic. She is a perfect actress and she can understand. She can understand a lot of things. And with the AI technology, she can behave in different ways. And maybe what I can add, which is very important for all of you, is, is not just academic work. First of all, Nadine has moved yesterday to AIA company. You know, it's an insurance in Singapore in Tempines office. And now she's sitting next to uh, many people who are uh, information agent to serve customers agents. So she is a truly a customer agent. In two weeks, she will go on with new customers and do exactly like the agents. So you see that will be a real case because all the planets speak well, robots, AI will invade, but in fact, uh, for the person who, you know, what, what they will do. So in this case, Nadine, you know, when you go at, at lunchtime, you need to queue up as a customer. <laughs> so that's quite a lot of people. So what Nadine will do, okay, fine. From 11 to three, she will work to support the others. You see, so instead of for the customers to wait and wait, she will, and then we will make user study. What you have to understand, Nadine can understand, speak to people, understand the question and answers, but what is better than a human, unfortunately, sorry to say that, <laughs> that you don't need a computer. Nadine is a computer. So the next Asian, when you ask a question, has to type things, and then the answer comes. And you know, it's quite a lot of process. But with Nadine, she doesn't need to type anything. She is a computer. So in this case, 
the service is perfect. And she can go, because she's autonomous, to many different information. So if you see the next slide, seven, I'm sorry for that, maybe look a bit technical, but it's just to say that, in fact, thanks to the microphone information, the speech, and also what we get is all kind of images we can get with a camera. Nadine has a camera, eyes, plus the speech. We can, from that on, analyze a lot of things. From all images, we can analyze, okay, what are the gestures of the people? What are they emotionally uh, expressing themselves? Where are they? And for the speech, we can analyze how they speak, First, the meaning of the speech, second, the intonation, and so on. So you see the main box is like an AI decision box that receiving all that in the software platform, Nadine will, according to emotion, memory, she can remind facts. So if you are identify, for example, she knows me, so whatever I say, she will build up the, the data set concerning me and then afterwards generate an answer. So what is interesting is in the future, I heard that we will have machine, we will have to learn all kinds of programming language. I understand that if we like to have a job, maybe the main job needs to be to develop this incredible software and also data set, the arrangement of data. But of course, this comes from not nowhere. We need absolutely to understand the fields where we are and to structure it. So I think it's a companion of the future. You have also seen in my uh, slides something that is very important. We have seen with Milken Institute data that we have a lot of elderly, particularly in China, will become so it's enormous amount of people, but you know, Germany, Switzerland, the same. So in this case, what can we do? I see my mom, just to give a personal example, which also pushed me to develop Nadine. So just to see, even if you can pay a good home, then it costs quite a lot of money. You get, okay, somebody takes care at the, when you get up at the lunchtime, but when you visited this home, Singapore, Europe, and so on, you will see that these people are pretty much alone and they don't get so many visitors. So because of that, I think, and I spoke to my dear mom, she said she was not a technological person, but she told me, you know, if I would have an adine that can talk to me, understand, uh, read books, uh, uh, do music or whatever, if I fall, monitor, communicate with others, that would be fantastic. So I think it is a, comp a companion of our future. So Nadia, um particularly in Japan, have been a leader in terms of elder care and using robots. It certainly don't look like uh, Nadine. In fact, <laughs> yeah. they look much more like, yeah. uh, like a robot. Mm. But what you're saying is that there'd be emotional interplay. Certainly, yes. if we're going to have a billion people yeah. that are going to be more than senior citizens, yes. really, yes. now people are living longer. Yeah. Uh, but, but the point is that this can provide a really important service for health care, health services, the insurance business, quite a range of different things to uh, basically extend the value and the quality of life, but by the same token, having uh, a technology that is really beneficial, helps at a governmental level, at a social services level. Uh, so this is actually very positive. This is not just all about the machines taking over, no. like when you call the airlines and you use a phone bot, that you don't know if it's a human or if it's a phone talking to you. That's so true, what you, your comment. I think, you know, we have to take positively the story of having built this technology. If you look from the antiquity, for example, in the Greek time, they have a super monster, uh, you know, and also in Middle, e in Middle Age, uh, for, with Leonardo da Vinci, they have already started to, to create this automaton. And if you go to Switzerland, you can see automaton from 18th century. They can write and do, but there was no software. So what I mean here is, is a dream of humanity. And because we were able to create this fantastic technology, let's use it for our benefits. And what you say is so true, because it, myself, I will come soon in the third age, Maybe I'm born too early, such a pity. But let's say the young ones around, they will enjoy, uh, you know, somebody dedicated to you. I mean, when there is nobody, in my case, should I ask my three daughters to stop their jobs? Or 
you know, Nadine kind of can help me. Of course, my three daughters cannot stop jobs. So if I need 24 hours, someone, great. Our technology, what we have developed over a century, will serve us. So this is not about autonomous automobiles or autonomous no. vehicles. This is autonomous humans. Yes. <laughs> but autonomous humans with a, with a meaning and something that's got investment credibility. Ms. Kanab, give us your views on this and tell us what, what you think adds to this debate. Well, I, when I started um, Auto AI, we also um, started in Asia and the Middle East and then in Europe and America. I have a small team in Silicon Valley. But Asia is growing so fast that the people in the other countries are also working on our Asian clients. And so I think I'd like to lend a little bit of insight into Asia and what's happening over here. Um, you know, I see in the last two years that we have been running this company a great deal of interest in artificial intelligence. In the Philippines, for instance, the CEOs of a lot of the major telcos, financial services, and other firms have said that they want to have a KPI to cut their business process outsourcing which itself is a huge revenue generator for the huge. country, by 70% in wow. the next three to four years. That's a and lot. It's a lot, and, it, and it's possible, actually, because we build a lot of those um, AI agents that can understand what people are asking in customer service, can give the answers much more quickly, as Nadine can, than somebody who's looking up. Um, the other thing that I find interesting about Asia is that there are certain things that are very uniquely Asian or maybe developing world. Give us like. some examples. So for example, um, you know, 80% of the food supply chain here comes from farmers who live on between $1 and $4 a day, it's kind of small holdings that they have. Um, they never are eligible for any insurance. So if there's a typhoon and they get wiped out, they have no insurance. They're very vulnerable to pest infestation, typhoons, etc. Because for the insurance company, if 100,000 farmers claim X percent of their land was devastated, they have to send out 10,000 people. But now, using satellite imagery, which is getting much cheaper, China is putting up a ring of satellites over the, the Iron Belt Road, but also there are a lot of private companies. You can use deep learning and hyperspectral imaging to actually warn farmers when there's a, a you know, thermal imprint on crops in their neighboring village or you can tell them how much of their uh, crop was actually inundated, and you can automatically do insurance claims processing. Um, and there are other things as well. I like this, love this example of Asian solution for Asian problems. Zhang An, I don't know if you know, it's, uh, it's the first insu online insurance company from China, hugely successful. You can't imagine how many places I go to in Asia, an insurance company, heads will tell me, can you just copy it? But one of the things they're doing is they're trying to fix the food supply chain. So as you know that when you go to a small town in China and you go to the grocery store and you pick up a piece of chicken, uh, you know, you're not really sure about whether it is chicken sometimes <laughs> <laughs> and its health, etc. So Zhang An has put uh, IoT sensors on the anklets of 23 million chickens. And they're going to be observing them, how they're moving, when they were born. And using computer vision analytics and IoT analytics, they are uh, going to put everything on blockchain so that when you go to your grocery store, you pick up that chicken packet, you put your phone on it, you know when it was born, how healthy it was, whether the other chickens That's were true. bullying it. Um, and so we see a lot more of these interesting examples of Asian solutions. Asian innovation for Asian problems. Um, another huge area is, of course, localization of language. Very important. And the pronunciation. That's right. And the difference of pronunciation between not just Mandarin speakers, but all across China, even here in Singapore or in Malaysia or in Indonesia, where there are variations just from province to province. Yes, and there are cultural biases. So very a very large government in the Middle East bought IBM Watson, because IBM Watson folks, the salespeople said, it can speak Arabic, it can understand Arabic. But their dialects, and it only understood Egyptian dialect of Arabic, and the, the others kind of looked down upon it. So that was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> so there's a lot of things you need to do um, to, to make sure that uh, the local needs of different um, 
communities in Asia are met. And I think that's a very exciting area that we see. Uh, another area that I find kind of interesting is that um, a lot of European companies and other companies are coming into Asia. So we work with some of the largest banks in Pakistan now, and their biggest threat is a Norwegian telco called Telenor. And I was in Oslo with the CEO of Sifke of, of Telenor, we're having dinner together. He's so sharp. Uh, so focused, understands the opportunity in financial services in Asia, that very soon, a couple of months after I had dinner with him, he sold off his Eastern European telco operations and partnered with uh, Ant Financial to go into China, uh, into Pakistan. So you have a Chinese company and a Norwegian telco going into Pakistan to become its largest bank, essentially. So I think these are uh, some of the things, because we work with the banks in Pakistan. We say, who are you afraid of? They're not really afraid of each other. They're kind of afraid of the telcos. So we work with a lot of telcos. And like Homera, because she's focused on manufacturing, they produce a lot of data. We focus on logistics, financial services, and telco, uh, because that's where you can see value and return for uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. Good point. So now let's go to some specific examples. And what I'd like to do is I'll take you through a few examples and I'd love to have your comments as we go along. Uh, in the whole area of health, healthcare, drug development, um, for example, uh, there are many side effects that are not known when you're doing drug development, medication, but artificial intelligence roots out new drugs from a database of molecular structures that no human could ever begin to analyze. So, for example, there's a company called Atomwise that was able to predict two drugs that could put a stop to Ebola using AI. Then in precision medicine, uh, there are deep genomics algorithms to scan through a patient's DNA looking for mutation anomalies linked to cancer. Craig Venter, the guy that de decoded the human genome, is uh, working particularly on this. And uh, even uh, IBM's Watson, um, was the first approved AI to diagnose disease, tackling blindness in rural areas. And AI for Healthcare in 2016 raised $5 billion. So you're seeing really interesting developments in uh, medicine and health. One other area that we'll go through is in uh, executive search and human resources. How many of you would have thought that there'd be AI in HR? Seriously, how many of you here would think of AI in HR, human resources and executive search? Anybody? Yes, mm. yes? no, no, yes. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Come on. <laughs> yes. Well, really, only 15% of you. Okay, so we'll tell, tell you a little bit more about that. Um, uh, but but the, this is the whole area of human resources being transformed. I'll give you an example. Infosys, an Indian company, gets 2 million job applicants a year for 20,000 positions. How on earth is their HR department going to analyze all of those? Well, AI is able to go through them very quickly. So I want some of your comments about that. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, the, the whole uh, Elon Musk. Everyone knows about Elon Musk. I don't know what he's been smoking lately, but everyone knows about him. <laughs> Well, he said he didn't inhale. He called up Bill Clinton before he did it. But in any event, um, he has a company that is not all that well known. It's a nonprofit called OpenAI. Uh, and basically, this showed that curiosity driven learning works well across a range of virtual environments, despite the agent being told nothing about the video games it was playing, nor given any signals when it died in the game. And then Uber have an AI lab in San Francisco that mimics evolution and it gets to an algorithm that's most suited to the job. So those are some examples. Any comments from all of you about health, healthcare, Elon Musk's uh, tobacco choice? No, not really. Um, uh, and, uh, and the whole area of HR. Um, well, in, in terms of HR, I think it's, it's really, it's like what we're seeing in apply, uh, application to compliance. Uh, any set where you can have huge uh, data to analyze, if you put machine learning uh, and AI to it, you'll get to another level. One is speed, and second is the ability to analyze everything. So you could think about 
uh, you know, a candidate who comes in, so not only screening candidates and, and people are doing, doing this with LinkedIn, right? But somebody who says, oh, and I have a passion in photography and whatever, whatever, through social media, you can actually double check if that person says the right thing or they just want that on the resume. Uh, in terms of compliance, and for me, an investment. Compliance, very yeah, key. Very important. Key uh, ESG, as many of you know, is, is a real trend, $81 trillion uh, of, uh, of, of assets uh, globally and rising. And uh, the G of ESG, I think, will be very much enhanced by AI because companies, wherever they are in the world, won't be able to uh, cheat anymore. Well, it might be a little bit, but the reality is chances that they get found uh, is much higher, and then things go public immediately. And you've seen it with Uber, with you know several companies. When that hits, there can be 99% of really good job or good work, but that 1% uh, can really destroy a company. So absolutely, and I think that's going to accelerate, you know, for sure. How many of you here use AI in your HR departments? Mm -hmm. That one man there, make a beeline for him immediately after the session, ladies and gentlemen. No, but seriously, that is an important thing to look at. If you've got a large uh, uh, employment uh, community in your companies or in your subsidiaries, it's something to be aware of for the future. Okay, let's have a look at uh, your analytics in terms of the healthcare business and health. Any comments from anybody? And, well, Mara. in general, on the healthcare side, um, Healthcare is another one of those industries that's a tough one to touch just because of the regulatory side. Very you important. cannot really touch a lot of that data. Right. But one of the things to look at healthcare side is the combination of various drugs that you can actually start to create in order to create cancer or in order to create any of these uh, any of the research work that they're doing in terms of applying certain combinations. Humanly, it's only possible to do certain ways of combinations. That's, that's really where they use a lot of AI now to start testing out certain drugs. The combination of things, the combination of different chemicals, that's what is being applied towards that. A lot of innovation is also being driven away, if you just outside of healthcare too. AI left on its own with some engineering around it is also creating a lot of learning on its own. Um, deep learning, you, deep, deep minds you mentioned, DeepMind actually created this model that they did not teach what is running, and they let that model go on its own. That model went on its own. First, it started to crawl, and then it started to learn that how, what is running. Then it started to learn how to actually jump over obstacles and how to actually create speed while jumping over obstacles as if I keep my arm like this and keep on moving it. So it's now teaching humans how to run better and that the model did not even know what was running. So these kind of new learning measures that are coming in, healthcare is the perfect candidate for those kind of things because we haven't even opened up all of the research work to try out the different combinations. I, I was actually reading one of the research related to some of the vaccines that they are now going to use all these combination of different vaccines actually to go out and test it out, first using AI and then go out and test it out actually in the market. So a lot of that testing that used to didn't happen or used to happen on the human side is going to be tested out by using AI in the labs now. Well, here's an interesting thing. How, when was the last time any of you went to see a dermatologist? You don't need to, that's good, that's healthy. Okay, but uh, dermatology is changing its way now because instead of going to see the dermatologist, you can take a photograph and the dermatologist does an analysis with a program and effectively, uh, in fact, uh, there was a paper at Stanford University in 2017 that spoke about the way in which dermatology is changing. But medical imaging using AI for mammograms, CT scans, osteoporosis, breast cancer, aortic aneurysms, uh, there's a 90% accuracy rate, way better than human analysis by medical professionals that have trained even at Harvard Medical School. So it just goes to show that the, uh, this is a key area. Electronic medical records, another key area where you would be able to have a much, much more informed, accurate way that you could measure your investment criteria, your KPIs that you'd mentioned earlier. Uh, the area of clinical decision support, another key area where AI is proving itself. So obviously we are citing a number of areas that, uh, in the space that are providing new insights into the way that you can also get better effective use of your capital deployment in terms of investments or companies that you might want to acquire. And on the question of acquisitions and M&A, how about due diligence? How many of you, you have used through your lawyers or maybe your investment uh, bankers 
to use AI to go through the due diligence. Anybody done that yet? Ah, smart. Because uh, just think of the huge piles of paperwork you have to go through, particularly if it's a difficult transaction. I was talking to someone last night, Reliance, the big company in India, uh, bought a company in America recently. 83 days of negotiation. Maybe that's not a lot by standards of going for a big public company. But the whole notion of due diligence being done in part to make sure that all of the document documentation actually was accurate. What do you think about that? I said to me, you speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, um, I, I, I would say I, I'm, I was still thinking to your last question, and I was thinking that when you go to a medical doctor, traditionally you have a service where uh, the medical doctor will look at what you have and eventually tell you if he knows today or if she knows. Today, with AI and in the next future, uh, we will have uh, access to so many other cases. So any illness you could have, as you explain also that you are able to analyze images and detect very precisely what it is. But what is important for, let's say, the person who is sick is immediately the, the illness may be more discovered and it will be more rightly discovered. So uh, because with AI, it will be possible to compare with millions of other more or less similar, and the machine will detect the cases that have the same symptoms and or express hidden, the or same- hidden symptoms. Yes. Hidden symptoms. Hidden symptoms, and then the medical doctor will report, and in fact, all that will mean that we will live much longer. So I think it's quite interesting in the domain of medical field because all this technology at the end of the day goes for humans, yeah, right? Is we do this for us, and if we can live healthier, longer, but in a better state, and identify for all kinds of illnesses which today are pretty more or less well identified. Let's go to. Okay. Sorry, we can add a big one. Yes. Um, so basically, we were talking about recruitment, and we've been talking about AI and how it's getting smarter. But in the beginning, whenever you start like a deep learning or any other kind of machine learning model, you start with the data that's already there, historical data. And for example, one company was using, uh, trying to train its AI recruitment engine on the kinds of people that it thought were good to hire. And after a while, I discovered that most of them were kind of men who were of a certain age, of a certain ethnicity. And they're like, wow, this AI must think that these guys must be better at their job. But actually, the truth was that it was just mimicking what the data was being put in. Right, that's very key. And one has to be very careful about bias. Um, in, in Google, for instance, it had all these young graduates from Stanford kind of teaching the Google algorithm image recognition. But there weren't that many women or ethnicity, so they were just testing it on themselves. So when they ran into some dark-skinned people, such as myself or African-Americans, it began to tag them as gorillas. And then it had to take it off. So this is a kind of thing that we have to be very careful about. Um, and you can imagine in health and other things, it can actually be quite problematic. OK, let's go to that slide deck um, where we quote Xi Jinping. Can we go to that uh, second slide deck that you've got there, please? A uh, slide before that. Let's go to the slide. There we are. Yeah. AI, one of the key pillars of Made in China 2025. So, of course, uh, China being recognized now as one of the leaders in AI. Of course, there are other countries that are very strong in it. Uh, not to say the United States isn't. It is very much so. A lot of movement all over the key development innovation cities in America. In Canada, particularly, a great leader in North America. Uh, certainly the UK, a lot of European yeah. countries very much in that. Let's go to the next slide, please. The next slide showing uh, how China's catching up the US in AI. There's a small little um, chart there from the Financial Times that might uh, have some interest for yourselves. Just looking at AI funding, the number of companies and the number of patents, patents that are actually coming forth from that. Let's go to the next slide. Here we are, we're looking at AI-related publications. Look at those three subjects, deep learning, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Of course, everything that you've actually noted and we've all been speaking about. But just look at that hockey stick pickup, really important, just to give you a sense that this is not just a trend line like a, 
uh, one of the, uh, the progeny of, uh, of the internet, this is really serious stuff about the future of industry, manufacturing, and commerce. Let's go to the next slide. Ah, ah. you had spoken about uh, Chicken. facial recognition <laughs> of chickens. <laughs> People thought that this is a lot of nonsense. Well, this year in China, this company is Zhonggan Online, uh -huh. will provide facial recognition to 23 million chickens. Yeah. Now, wouldn't you like to know the chicken that you're going to be eating in six months' time? But the truth is, I mean, this is amazing. You think it's, but the point is, in terms of health sustainability, yeah. to make sure that the blockchain of of uh, chickens that are grown for health so that avian flu or some other something in this space uh, would, might be difficult. Let's go to the next slide. Ah, Yao Ming. How many of you have heard of Yao Ming, the basketball player? Well, there's a life-size robot of Yao Ming. What do you think of that? Maybe we could oh, introduce wait. him to Nadia. Really, <laughs> Nadine. That's right. It'll be a slam dunk. It'll be a slam dunk. That is for sure. Okay, so... Um, as we come towards the close of this uh, really interesting session, we'd love to ask for some questions from the audience. From, if you've got something that you'd like to see, if you could stump the team. Any questions? <laughs> There's somebody at the back there. Have we got a mic that we can take to the back? Or uh, can we... Have, do we have a mic? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. User side, isn't it been practically impossible to engage anyone to help us to even develop any system of AI because one, we're <laughs> That's the general perception that, that we have seen, actually, not just from a medical perspective, but in, in generally in most of the industries when I said they're data rich. Um, it's not as easy as everybody thinks that to convert that into useful information. There is a path. You have to take a journey towards it. And I think there are, there, are, there are a few steps before you can even start applying AI to it. So there's a reality, and then there is obviously all this hype that you hear about. The reality is you have data. Is that, is that data in a manner that's usable, that, is, that can be plugged in and it can be used to create information from it? Or before you even go there, you have to take those three steps before you get to that fourth step. So I think there's that reality. I think you just you what you have to do is really partner with the right set of people who mm. can make that happen for you, and I think that's what you haven't mm. probably come across as. We yet. all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I would also add that the fact is today you you stood up and you asked a question, and maybe three years ago you would not have, and I think that's a very important step, um, given the acceleration that we foresee. Uh, most likely, if countries want to keep their competitive advantage, so not Very only true. companies, Good you point. will have invitation by governments or enlightened governments, and that goes back to that gap that I talked about, developed countries and emerging countries, on that vision and leadership. Because frankly, if you were told, um, you know, here's a program that you could try, and, and you know, I don't want to say government get involved in everything, but we subsidize <laughs> part of it just, just as a trial, uh, you probably would find that much easier, and my bet is that within five years, you will be on that journey. Let's uh, see if there's another question. There's a good-looking gentleman at this table there. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's right. <laughs> so I'm Vikesh from SMB Can you speak as loudly as you can, please, Vikesh, so that everyone can hear you? I try. Uh, I'm Ritesh from SMB Global Ratings. Uh, yeah. My question is, like in human context, when we talk of intelligence, you can converse and you can figure out how intelligent. There's IQ. IQ. And everybody, when they talk about we are AI powered, as in how do we distinguish between the capability right. of one AI from the other? Is there some kind of standard, some kind of measure? Very good question. <laughs> Myself, I think we cannot distinguish because AI 
as normally globally spoken is like something global, but it is not. They are specific algorithms applied to everything. So for example, for, for speech, for image recognition, and so on, and for business, and all kinds of things. So it's very specific. It's nothing general. So for me, uh, also as a, let's say, computer scientist, I would never speak of AI as such, but I will speak of algorithm uh, with certain data being applied in every domain. So uh, this is how I see more concretely things. So it's difficult to, to answer your question. Do you want to have the final word on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this whole idea of general artificial intelligence is a myth at the moment. Uh, it doesn't, there's, it's all narrow AI, which yeah. is very specific for a specific mm. task. Uh, there's no AI that can kind of even come close to human beings and how we think. But within AI, also some parts of it are becoming much faster to do. Uh, ever since the ImageNet uh, program at Stanford, now computer recognition is so much faster. So there are libraries being built uh, upon which we can leapfrog. So there is variation between it. So you can automate certain things, but then you add, can you understand what that person is saying? Then can you give him some suggestions? Each is a leap in the depth of complexity of the AI. Okay, so here's a good analysis for you. When the mobile business first started, as you can see here, phone that I used to have 15 years ago, when mobile started, you never thought that you'd be able to live the life you do today with your mobile device. Well, we're at that junction now with AI. It's here, it's coming. You can make a lot of money if you invest smartly, accurately, and with some foresight. Because in the 21st, tech, 21st century technological era, and the skills that are needed for executives and companies to function, AI gives you good IQ and good EQ, and gives you a good thank Q. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, We've had fantastic, these, these uh, women uh, here on this session have really given us an insight. Please uh, give a big round of applause to our great participants. <laughs> My name is Ralph Simon. Hope you have a great, great Milk in Asia Summit, a great, great event here in Singapore and for Asia. So good luck. Happy hunting and good balance sheets at the end of the financial year. Adios.